Um, uh, so welcome everyone to uh, uh, this month's edition of uh, Curiosity during quarantine. This is ICTS's uh, online avatar of uh, Curio a copy with Curiosity, which uh, we used to have uh, jointly with the planetarium uh, at the uh, Nehru Planetarium campus in uh, Bangalore City. Uh, uh, unfortunately, for the last several months, we haven't been able to have uh, the uh, physical version at the planetarium, but we are continuing uh, with uh, these talks, which have been very popular uh, uh, in this online avatar. And uh, uh, today it's a pleasure to have Professor Raghum Murthugode uh, uh, talking to us about a very important problem of climate change. Uh, we've had the uh, uh, already some talks on, on this in the last several years, uh, but uh, it is such a crucial uh, problem facing our planet that uh, I think uh, the multiple perspectives that uh, different scientists bring are very valuable. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we've had uh, several talks on this. And in fact, uh, 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 Professor Raghu has uh, been uh, uh, um, uh, at ICTS in person uh, 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 two years ago when he gave a summer course on the Earth's climate, its past, present, and future. Uh, and you can actually, those who of you who are interested, can actually watch uh, the videos of that summer course. Uh, it is available on ICTS's YouTube channel, ICTS Talks, uh, as also are available all the previous Copy with Curiosity talks, all of the other public lectures and outreach activity uh, talks that ICTS organizes, uh, and um, and um, uh, and a vast number of technical lectures, uh, and we've had uh, some programs already on uh, uh, at ICTS on climate and related topics. Uh, and so I invite people who are interested in this problem to explore our webpage uh, and. Um, uh, uh, I think you will find an enormous amount of resources there. Uh, I, I just for people who have uh, not been to uh, this curiosity during quarantine or copy with curiosity, um, ICTS is a center of the Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research, uh, which now has campuses all over India uh, and in Bangalore. We are one of the three campuses of TIFR. Uh, ICTS, NCBS, the Center for Biological Sciences, and uh, TIFR, uh, Center for Applicable Mathematics, all of which are in Northwest Bangalore uh, and uh, with very close connections with each other. Uh, so ICTS's special mandate is to organize uh, programs bringing together some of the top researchers in the world and India uh, together for uh, 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 workshops, discussion meetings, schools on advanced topics in the theoretical sciences, but very broadly understood, uh, uh, broadly construed. And, uh, and uh, we have uh, been having on average something between 20 to 25 programs uh, per year in the last few years with a large number of participants. You will find these uh, uh, and the talks uh, from these programs uh, up on our web page, as I mentioned. Uh, so I hope uh, uh, many of you who are, especially the ones in Bangalore, will be able to come at some point to the ICTS campus if you haven't uh, and attend one of our uh, uh, public lectures or other events in person. Uh, but till then, we make do with this. Uh, 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 online avatar. And uh, uh, with that, let me thank uh, again Professor uh, Murthugade for uh, 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 agreeing to speak in this forum. And I will hand it over to um, uh, Professor Joseph Samuel uh, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Rajesh. So, friends, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Raghu Murthugade, who studies climate change one of the most dire crises threatening our planet today. Raghu is a professor at the University of Maryland and also holds a visiting position at IIT Bombay. He has degrees in aeronautical and mechanical engineering and has also worked for NASA. Raghu's interests are in the interactions between life and the physical world, 
and what they mean for sustainability. He studies the impact of climate change on food, water, energy, and health. As people are keenly aware today, we are facing an increased threat from extreme events like forest fires, the ongoing snowstorm in Texas, and closer to home, the glacial burst in Uttarakhand. While the science is clear, humanity's response is far from concerted. Today, Raghu will tell us why climate change is such a wicked problem. Raghu, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you, uh, Gopkumar. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I don't know how many people are logged in or whether you can see, but if there is really anybody who doesn't believe uh, in climate change, you can indicate to the host at the end, maybe I'll want to see the numbers or something. But what is a wicked problem? It actually comes out of uh, a definition that evolved in the Berkeley University of California, Berkeley in the 60s by uh, urban design professors who are trying to solve space problems uh, in the city. And they uh, came up with this idea that there are some problems that society faces, particularly like climate change, uh, which are called wicked problems. It's not a moral statement, it's morality of the problem, but uh, wicked in the sense that they are really not uh, problems that have solutions. So they can only be resolved, which means uh, often they have to be resolved again and again. So this is the idea of the uh, wicked problem. And I wrote an article based on that original idea in The Wire a while ago that uh, climate change is also a wicked problem. Other people have used similar ideas, but here more in the context of uh, climate change, I uh, listed 10 reasons and I'll go through them. So I think most people are probably already aware of what climate change is. Very simply speaking, we have energy coming from the sun in the so-called short wave. And because the Earth is a sphere, uh, there is more energy falling per unit area in the low latitudes, as you can see here in the tropics, uh, than in the high latitudes because of the curvature. And the anything that is uh, falling at this visible, for example, the fire you can see on this light panel, uh, is heating the Earth, and then the energy is going out in uh, bands that are not visible, uh, infrared, long wave, and whatever other words uh, we use. So this spot is a good example of being hot, but you don't see it uh, unless you go close. And climate change basically means we put a blanket on, the, on top of this spot so that the heat is getting trapped, and that is our greenhouse gas effect. We have uh, tri molecules, basically like CO2, H2O, N2O, methane, uh, which is not a tri molecule. Uh, are actually uh, sensitive to uh, the outgoing long wave energy, but not so for the uh, incoming short wave. So they allow energy to come in and trap the energy going out. So as we increase the greenhouse gases, we end, uh, are trapping more energy, which is heating everything. And then the question is, uh, what do we do with it? We know by now that since the industrial revolution, some people would even go to the beginning of the Holocene, we have been increasing the carbon dioxide, which is measured uh, very precisely and accurately because it's a so-called well-mixed gas. Once you put it in the atmosphere, it's got a lot, uh, it's very inert. It's got a very long residence time, so it gets mixed. So if you gets mixed, so if you measure it at one or two locations in a hemisphere, you have a good idea of its concentration. And uh, we have a very good account of it because it comes from fossil fuels which are a very valuable commodity, how much is sold, how much is burned, is all tracked very well as well. So the, more, the whole idea uh, of controversy around climate change has been aroused by uh, invested, interested parties like fossil fuel companies or politicians uh, who use this red line, which is showing a nice increasing uh, profile of carbon dioxide, which is accelerating now every year. But if you look at the global mean temperature change, you can see that it has this black line has lots of ups and downs, and there are periods where it's flat, even in the more recent uh, time and so on. So they say, where is the def uh, re uh, relation between carbon dioxide and temperature? And this is actually quite a complicated problem, and if the general audience gets uh, uh, confused, then uh, we shouldn't get dismayed we should try to see why that confusion arises. So I will raise uh, some of the issues of why 
uh, climate change then becomes a wicked problem. So in terms of the natural science of it now, we pretty much know that there are multiple evidences, increasing temperature alone, that uh, humidity increases, sea level rises, glaciers are melting, extreme events. So you have multiple evidences of why uh, we can link uh, the physics of increasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases like methane and two HFCs, etc., to this uh, warming, and how we can actually attribute that increase to also um, changes in weather patterns, uh, whether it's a monsoon uh, or uh, heat waves, and so on and so forth. So, why is it then a wicked problem? Uh, we can start right away with this idea of what actually climate change means. Uh, some of you probably remember it used to be called global warming, which is what this temperature here is, but nobody really lives in a global mean temperature and it's not just temperature, it's got all these other effects on sea level glaciers and extreme events. So we switched to climate change and then people started saying, well, climate always changes, which is true. I'll come back to that, that throughout Earth's history, climate has changed and it will change. The question is, how are we altering the natural variability? How would climate change just because of, let's say, a change in the output of the sun, a change in the orbital parameters, you know, Earth has obliquity, it has precession, it has electricity of the orbit. Those things change naturally because of gravitational pull of the other planets. Uh, how are those things uh, changing climate and how is this uh, CO2 emission, greenhouse gas emission, altering the mode of natural climate variability. So you can see here uh, the surface air temperature uh, historical over some last uh, 100 years or so, let's say, which shows that there are certain regions like the uh, Arctic region, which is warming much faster. It is called uh, polar amplification because there is snow and ice and there are uh, cloud effects. It actually warms faster even when you increase greenhouse gases uh, everywhere. And there are regions in the ocean, like off of Greenland, where ocean circulation actually produces uh, even a cooling while other regions are warming. And the tropics cannot warm much more because they're already warm. If you warm them, uh, you begin to have convection and cyclones, which actually take the energy away and redistribute it, and so on and so forth. And if you look at the uh, historical change over India, you see that uh, the, the temperature change is not uniform. This is annual mean. You can also look at seasonal trends. Uh, these are degrees centigrade per uh, year or so. I didn't put the scale, but it doesn't matter. You can see that the Northwest is warming more and this region is warming less and so on and so forth. So climate change by itself is not a very uh, solid definition. So you have to be uh, careful with people when they say what is climate change. The other thing is you can't know when you actually solve the problem under the, the climate change umbrella, which means that uh, we can use the example of 2020. For example, if you think about the, all the COVID lockdowns, uh, you can show that the CO2 and the greenhouse gas emissions dropped quite significantly because of the lockdowns and the associated reductions in transportation, uh, industrial activities, and so on. And that actually resulted in a uh, global uh, reduction in uh, the uh, distribution of uh, pollution and so on. Yet, you can see that 2020 is now uh, tying record with 2016 as the warmest year in uh, instrumental record between 1850 to 1900. Uh, this is because uh, the CO2 that has a long residence time, it stays in the atmosphere for a long time because it's so inert, it'll stay for a couple of centuries to even much longer. So all the CO2 that we have put in has accumulated because it doesn't disappear quickly, you keep on adding more and more. So we have what is called committed warming. So even though we reduced for 2020 the total emissions, the accumulated CO2 from the past has still the ability to warm, plus the changes associated with the local reduction or secular reduction in 2020 projects uh, onto various patterns, which uh, we will see here. So this is the annual mean warming of uh, 2020. And you can see that the Siberian region had a 100 year record in terms of the warm temperatures. And India actually had a bit of cooling because of the reduction in pollutions. Uh, ocean here cooled. 
And then because of this, there was increased pre-monsoon rains because uh, something called Western disturbances, which come from this region onto India during the pre-monsoon season and the winter months, which actually bring a lot of snow to the Himalayas and are a good thing, actually produce lots of rain all the way from uh, East Africa into Afghanistan, Iran, and so on, and over India as well. And the temperatures, food temperatures were cooler, lots of greenery. So locust swarms began to arrive on top of those winds because of this food that was available here, which were, they were deprived of in the uh, East African region. So you have all these cascading effects. So you can't know what exactly you solved. Just because you reduced the uh, pollution, let's say, of greenhouse gases, and you uh, thought you solved the problem, this problem will go on for a while because the residence time of uh, CO2 is uh, so long. And that brings us to this kind of uh, a figure where we are looking at uh, historical emissions. Uh, typically, emissions we measure as uh, what is in the atmosphere in terms of concentrations, which is parts per million, as many of you may know. Uh, but you also can measure it as the total amount of CO2 uh, em emitted in terms of gigatons of CO2 per year. Some of it goes into the atmosphere, some into the vegetation, some stays in the atmosphere. So what we measure in the atmosphere is just the atmospheric part, but what we emit is the total. So in general, for any greenhouse gas, we have to worry about what is its concentration in the atmosphere, because that's what determines the greenhouse effect, the change in the greenhouse effect over the background levels. The residence time or any given gas, for example, methane only stays in the atmosphere for about a decade, and 2 can stay for uh, 25 years to uh, much longer. Uh, hydrofluorocarbons can stay much longer and so on. And they have something called global warming potential, which means if CO2 has the ability to uh, warm by one degree C over a certain time for a given concentration, how much is the relative warming by other gases? So methane is about 25 to, uh, times as powerful as uh, CO2, and 2O is almost 200 times as powerful as CO2 and so on. So the global warming potential also matters. So whenever we worry about greenhouse effects, we have to worry about greenhouse gases, their concentration, their residence time, and their global warming potential. So when we want to solve this problem, we are starting here with our historic period. We are on this track of emission, uh, and then we are projecting for the future. If we don't do anything and we go uh, in what is called business as usual or just maintain our uh, current consumption patterns and emission pattern, will end up uh, with the emissions uh, per year uh, around here, but that will give us a warming of more than five degrees centigrade. But based on various ideas, uh, not necessarily all scientific, they often are politically determined targets like staying under two degrees centigrade compared to the pre-industrial level of uh, temperature and so on. And then we decided 1.5 degrees C is much uh, safer than two degrees C above pre-industrial. So 2 degrees C warming will require that we should have already started to draw down the CO2 by 2020, which we are not doing. Despite the 25 years of negotiations, the CO2 emissions have gone up and up and have not shown any sign of reduction. And COVID was the first time that they showed a sign of reduction, but we are now right back to the normal levels. And if you want to do uh, 1.5 degrees C, then at some time in 2050, your emission has to be negative. So you have to actually draw down more CO2 from the atmosphere than you are emitting. So it's not that you will emit negative CO2, but you will emit some CO2 and you will take out somehow in what is called carbon capture, uh, you will take out more than you emitted. And that will be essential if you want to hit the 1.5 degree centigrade target. But this is also a wicked problem in the sense 1.5 degree C for how long? Is it forever? Is it for 10 years? And if you cross 1.5 degrees C, uh, how long can you cross? Can you overshoot by 10 years and come back? What will be the impact? So you can imagine that the solutions are hardly uh, clear and the continued melting of glaciers and so on will uh, go on, sea level rise especially will go on for uh, many centuries. So climate change also is a wicked problem. Uh, solutions to climate crisis are not true or false or good or bad. Uh, in the sense, uh, let's say somebody wants to have fancy cars. This is a collection of 
cast by one actor. I won't say who it is. So uh, as an technological development, uh, this is a vehicle that wants to take you from point A to point B. So fuel efficiency, good looks are all important. But for some people, it becomes a toy and they want to collect it. But let's say you built a car that's not anything, it's electrical and so on. Uh, then what is, is it good for somebody to buy so many cars or not? Okay, so it's not always uh, uh, good or bad or true or false kind of uh, solution. Plus, many actions are involved in how we impact uh, climate. For example, this looks complicated, but I'll just explain it. We are just looking at the amount of calories we consume and where the source is. Let's say we look at just the amount of fish and other meat we consume, and we look at a person who is driving a Prius versus a, a person who is driving a Camry. In India, you can think of hybrid car versus uh, some bigger car like a Duster or something, uh, or a, even a bigger car like, I don't know, the Indian big SUV. You can think of that, uh, Mahindra or something. So this shows that uh, depending on how many calories you get from non-vegetarian food, your uh, additional carbon footprint will be larger such that a person who is driving a hybrid car but eating a lot of meat can actually emit more CO2 than a person who is driving a big car but is a vegetarian. Okay. So just because you bought a hybrid car and it's friendly for the environment doesn't mean you have solved the problem because it also you also have to see uh, how much meat you are consuming. So you can see how uh, good or bad uh, solutions are not necessarily well-defined in these kind of situations. Uh, fourthly, the, the, this, uh, <laughs> I keep getting this bloody zoom window on top of my things up and read it, but solutions to climate change generate unexpected consequences over time, making it difficult to measure their effectiveness. For example, industrial revolution itself was a great thing for humanity. Uh, life got so much more convenient. We can fly around, travel around the world, see places, cultural exchanges, good food, uh, you know, refrigeration at home, air conditioning, everything. But the consequence has been that we got climate change. And think about clean energy, for example. This article is on how clean energy has a dirty secret. Solar panels, for example, have a 20-year uh, period. A lot of the ones that got installed uh, in very early on are now uh, being decommissioned, but getting rid of them is not so easy. So you need what is called a life cycle analysis, where you start with the raw materials that are used, let's say for, for producing uh, uh, solar panels, the manufacturing process, the packaging, the transportation, where it's used and how it is disposed. So even if you're drinking a bottle of juice, the cap is made somewhere, the bottle is made somewhere, the fruit is grown somewhere, it is pulped somewhere, it's juiced somewhere, it's transported to you, and then you do something with the bottle and the cap. So this kind of life cycle analysis is, uh, is needed if you want to really understand the end-to-end -end emissions of any particular thing. And obviously, we cannot always do that, right? Not, uh, normal people cannot worry about it, even though now recycling and so on is going up. People are aware and want to do something good. But it turns out that uh, many corporations are just lying about whether their product is really recyclable or not. So a lot of the material is just being disposed of in random places. Okay, and does anybody know how to get rid of it? Every solution we deploy will have potentially irreversible consequences. So in some sense, the CO2 we have put in is uh, uh, irreversible in the sense it is, if, unless we find a way to take it out of the air, it will hang around for a long time. It's already in the ocean, in the vegetation, and you know that the forests can catch fire and they can re-release enormous amounts of carbon back to the atmosphere and so on. So if you think about what we do, we want to grow food, but agriculture emits, as I will show in a minute, about 25% of the total emission. And the impact of that is in terms of warming, it's not only going to change temperature and rainfall, but also affect soil quality, food consumption, and so on. So, crop yields are going to get affected and are already being affected. So 
we try to correct it by putting fertilizers and then fertilizers pollute the soil and the water and the air and so on cause health problems. Uh, we need water and water is now a big problem because even though India gets almost 200 lakh crore buckets of water uh, rain each year, each person in India has about 2 lakh buckets we get from the monsoon and yet even a, a city like Mumbai or Udupi which get 3 meters of rain tend to run out of water in the summer months of uh, April, May. So use of water for irrigation around the world, almost 80% or more of the wa fresh water surface water is being used for irrigation, which has huge impacts on soil health and so on as well. And of course, we are affecting the ecosystems. The monsoon onset is changing, withdrawal is changing, length of the rainy season is changing, how it rains during the season is changing, uh, cyclones, everything is changing. Right? So what we do as a part of our life, food, water, and energy, tend to have these irreversible consequences. So you can see the emission here. Energy production is almost 75% of the emission. Within that, you have energy use in the industries, in the transportation sector. Building, uh, buildings use a lot of energy. For a country like India, which is so hot, it is now very fashionable to build uh, new buildings with these glass fronts, which increase the energy use. So why do we need it? Because it's aesthetic, it looks good, it's fun to look at, fun to work in, more light inside and so on, right? Uh, agriculture and forestry here and other land use, waste, industry. So you can see that pretty much everything we do has a negative consequences, uh, unintended consequences, unfortunately, but there we are. Uh, and then to solve the problem, we also have things we do that are very intuitive and yet not very good. For example, the Kyoto Protocol, which solved the problem of ozone hole by banning CFCs, then got into HFCs, which are actually much worse in terms of global warming potential, and the residence time of some of the HFCs is multiple centuries. So when it gets very warm and India is getting hotter and hotter, and economy is growing, people are becoming richer, what do we do? We buy window units. The more window units we buy, the worse it is for the warming which we are trying to solve. And this is a good climate adaptation uh, solution. If it's hot, you buy AC and you're fine. But obviously it has this unintended consequence. So this is something that makes climate change also a wicked problem. Ordinary problems usually come with a limited set of potential solutions, but climate change doesn't. For example, the idea that Montreal Protocol solved the ozone hole problem was uh, possible because ozone hole, which would increase UV and affect everybody equally, actually was bad for everybody. So the countries solved it. Most of it was paid for by US, Japan, and Europe. Uh, they were more worried, obviously, higher latitudes, lighter skin, and so on. But CFC could be replaced by HFC, simple. Obviously, it turned out it's not that simple. And COVID right now seems like such a nightmare of a problem. And yet, this McKenzie report actually shows uh, when COVID will actually uh, disappear, depending on when the herd immunity kicks in. We are all excited because the vaccines are here. When we are all convinced that uh, everybody will take vaccine or enough number of people will take the vaccine. and the problem will be solved soon enough, right? Uh, and yet, this seems like such a difficult problem. But climate change is not so, so uh, easy at all. So this is a book called Drawdown, uh, and you can it's Paul Hawken, uh, and it lists 100 solutions to reverse global warming. Wow, that's very comprehensive here, going from refrigeration, wind turbines, reduced food waste, plant-rich diet, and so on. So you have 100, and this is not even a comprehensive list, okay? So it, there is no one solution. You have to do so many things, which means uh, it's going to be really, really difficult to implement the solutions. And you can see another depiction of this. This is not even readable. This is such a rich target, uh, uh, 100 solutions to reverse global warming covering all the solutions. Uh, this is already uh, creating problems because this is like putting up signs everywhere saying, no, don't do this, don't do that, don't fly, don't eat too much meat, don't eat too much fish, don't drive too much, uh, don't use too much electronics, right? You cannot do anything. So 
for a lot of the young people, especially, this is causing what is called climate anxiety. This alarmist messages that are coming at us all the time. You cannot open any news uh, media anywhere without getting bad news about climate change every day. It's as if the world is coming to an end. And in the middle, you have this little sliver of good news that we over landed on Mars. So it's, instead of kids growing up thinking about building a rocket to go to Mars and beyond, they are always worried that maybe the planet is coming to an end because of climate change. So this is the kind of wicked problem that uh, we are dealing with. Um, the other one is that climate change has no precedent, right? Experience is not going to help, you, uh, help us deal with it much. You might think that we have great experience, but if you see what's happening in Texas that uh, Joseph mentioned, or uh, every year we have these flood problems, the glacier bursts that happen. Uh, so even though we think we have technology, climate conflicts are a lot. The Syrian war problem is directly related to climate change. There are many other conflicts in the Rohingya problem, water problem, climate problem, sea level rise, Bangladesh, what's, what's, uh, who's going to deal with that problem? Pakistan is having 14 hours of power outage because they are getting so little rain, which is only going to get worse, and they're warming a lot. They had 50 degree heat wave last year and the year before that. So these problems in the neighborhood, if uh, landslides and glacier bursts increase, Nepal will have more and more problems. Whose problems are those? Those are going to be India's problems. So we're all in this uh, together. So this is a nice figure that shows the temperature anomaly with respect to the modern climate, going back to the time of the dinosaurs. And you can see that during the time of the dinosaurs, the, the CO2 was a thousand parts per million. So it was three times the uh, concentration we have now. But why do we have to worry? Because during this time, human beings were not around. So we are not used to that. Over time, climate has changed uh, on, at many scales. You can see here uh, the million years before, uh, thousands of years before, and the linear scale at the end. Uh, modern human being as we are, agricultural and then industrial beasts that we are, with very high energy consumption, we only evolved in these last 12,000 years since the last ice age. During that time, I will show another figure, we will see that the, the global mean temperature has only changed by about half a degree to one degree. So we have not experienced massive changes of temperature during our uh, solid period of evolution of the last 10,000 years. And where we are headed is pretty scary because the rate of change is also much faster than anything that has happened in the past. This Paleocene, Eocene maximum that happened about 55 million years ago where the temperatures shooted up by about five degrees happened over thousands of years, whereas now we are shooting up in just uh, a century or less, okay? When you change the temperature, the rate of change, how fast you change it matters because many species will not be able to adopt. Part of humanity may not be able to adapt unless, uh, we share all the technology to protect everybody, which is a big uh, question as well. Who will provide all the technology? Even if India wants to switch from HFCs for refrigeration to another uh, uh, refrigerant that is less harmful, where will it come from? Will they give, it, give the technology to us for free or they will want a lot of money for it? That's not so obvious. So any experience we may have had in the Holocene is not necessarily going to help us despite our technological prowess that uh, we think we have. So this is showing the temperature change uh, over the Holocene. You can see there is a Holocene optimum, which was about one degree C warmer than the long term. Uh, medieval warming when the Vikings occupied the Greenland and then they went extinct. We had the little ice age when Europe froze over. And then since industrial revolution, we have been accelerating this warming. So this is the main experience we have as a species of change of very small magnitude. So we are not necessarily uh, experienced to deal with this. So that's another thing we have to uh, really worry about. Um, while ordinary problems are self-contained, climate change is mixed up with uh, many other uh, problems and it doesn't have one root cause. So 
if we look at climate change relevant trends, GDP increase is a great thing. Every country wants to grow its GDP at 7%, 10%, especially India and China cry and their rates drop below 7%, whereas rich countries are very happy with 3%, 4% because they're already rich. Atmospheric CO2 has increased, M2O, greenhouse gases have increased, population has increased, and I will say in a minute that population increase is used as one of the causes for global warming, but that's not so obvious. Uh, ozone depletion, uh, great floods have increased, coastal nitrogen, fertilizer use, fisheries exploited, a uh, number of vehicles, international tourism, and so on. So everything we do as a part of our standard of living and quality of life is bad for the environment. So it's not just one thing. Everything is related to uh, climate change. So that makes it a nightmare to deal with as well. Um, if uh, Let me move into climate by explaining how we have to uh, think about it. So if you go to the historical emissions from the Industrial Revolution, obviously United States and Europe are responsible for majority of the emissions and India, China, Mexico, Brazil, et cetera, have contributed very small amounts. But we decided as a, a combined species that maybe we cannot go but too far back because nobody knew that CO2 emission was so bad. So let's stick to only from 1990 onwards, uh, who's emitting CO2. In this case, China, of course, jumps out now as a big contributor, US remains big, Europe, and then India is still small, but continues to grow. So now we are all in this together. Everybody is emitting, especially countries like China and India, which want to grow, do not necessarily have renewable energy set up yet. So they are still burning a lot of coal, and you cannot stop them. If other rich countries got rich by polluting, then how can they stop poor countries from becoming rich by burning fossil fuels as well? Right? So this is another aspect of this uh, wicked problem. But coming to uh, population, if you look at per capita emission, okay, United States is still way up there with 16 uh, tons uh, of emission per person per year. Uh, China is growing and it's already passed many European countries and is around eight. India is still down here less than two. Maybe now it's about two tons per capita per uh, year. But this is still tricky because in India, the rich people, even people like us who are scientists and making a decent living, our emission is order four or five. And it's the very poor that have very low carbon footprint. When we average, it looks uh, like it's low, but the growth in economy and the increase in GDP, middle class growing, comes with increased per capita consumption and uh, increase in pollution. The other aspect of population is that, yes, population has grown, especially in countries like India and China, but it comes with low per capita consumption. In the rich world, where women have fewer and fewer kids, what do they do? they give as much money as possible to each kid and their consumption jumps to these levels. So reduced population is actually coming with increased per capita consumption. So even if we killed a lot of poor people since industrial revolution, the emission we have now would be almost the same because it's not the poor people who have been emitting a lot, it's the rich people. And even now, the population reduction is not guaranteed to come with reduced emissions because lower population is actually increasing consumption when people have only one or two kids. So we have to be very careful about the population problem and using it to beat up on poor countries saying population is bad and population is bad. Consumption is what we have to keep our eye on. Of course, population is not good because we are uh, encroaching on habitats, tiger human con conflicts, elephant human conflicts, uh, oceans being uh, fished away and so on. I'm not saying population growth is okay, but if you consider the carrying capacity of the planet and per capita consumption, reducing per capita consumption is going to be much more important than uh, reducing population, especially because just educating women is solving the population problem by itself. Fertility, fertility rates have been dropping for almost several decades. So this is something we have to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, next, the 
corporations which are uh, very good at making profits and also claiming that they are trying to be sustainable, carbon neutral, and so on, are always motivated by uh, profit. So Volkswagen, which comes from Germany, one of the most progressive countries, actually got cheating on software of the emissions and uh, was fined billions of dollars. And extra emissions from resulted from that cheating actually has attributed to deaths of more than a thousand people in countries like Poland and Hungary and so on. Japan, which had the Fukushima disaster, uh, where earthquake caused a tsunami, which caused damage to the nuclear plant and many deaths and a lot of scare, said they will go back to burning coal. But actually, they were cheating a little bit because their emissions were already going up before the Fukushima. So you have to be careful of how countries use something as an excuse to jump from one thing to the other. So that's also something we have to watch. And Toyota, which is so famous for making good cars, efficient cars, hybrid cars, electric cars, actually paid a record fine for a decade of Clean Air Act violation. So this human behavior of always focusing on profits is always going to lead us to cheating on climate action. This is something we have to worry about as well. Climate change involves many stakeholders, nearly all of whom have different ideas of the problem and its ideal solutions. So for India, it is investing in solar, investing in uh, wind, it's uh, increasing, trying to increase forest cover also, although there are conflicts with uh, some tribal communities because it is not being done in a very holistic way, I suppose. Uh, but India, if you look at its energy projection going from 2010, uh, its net oil imports are continue, uh, are expected to increase for the next couple of decades. So it is not energy independent and it's not going to be energy independent anytime soon. So how will it pay, play a role in the global actions against climate change? Its value on its economy versus climate action is always going to be based on its need for energy its desire for economic growth, its ambition to take its people out of poverty into uh, middle class and rich and so on. So global warming actually creates winners and losers. Uh, I will show in a minute that there are many countries actually which benefit from uh, global warming. So we are not going to agree on what is the best solution. Plus, if you look at this graph, again, don't worry, it looks complicated, but this is on the horizontal axis, what is called uh, Human Development Index, which is about per capita GDP, women's education, children's health, women's health, and so on. It's an index of how well the society is doing. Uh, and this on this axis is the ecological footprint uh, per person in terms of how many hectares are, uh, are you effectively using as a person in terms of the resources you are consuming. The rich countries are obviously up here, Belgium, Sweden, Australia, Finland, and so on, which have a high human development index, rich societies, but they accomplished with accomplished that with uh, a high ecological footprint. All the poor countries are down here. So how do you move these poor countries into high human development index? Do you have to go here to high ecological footprint, or is there a way to move them here, uh, keeping the ecological footprint low. That will require technology sharing, innovation sharing, uh, funding poor countries to deal with climate change, etc. Will that happen? Not so clear right now. Okay, so this is a global adaptation index which uses uh, your country's ability to deal with coastal erosion, sea level rise, floods, droughts, heat waves, etc. And you can see that the rich countries have high adaptation index Developing countries and poor countries have a very low adaptation index. They have an adaptation gap. So they are not necessarily equipped to deal with the climate change, which so far is mainly created by the rich countries. That's what makes it wicked as well. Okay, we have to deal with it, but there we are. So problem solvers, uh, God, oh. sorry. Problem solvers are liable for the consequences of any actions they take because the actions will have large impact. So scientists, for example, always blame politicians saying they don't listen to scientists. The scientists don't have to win elections. They don't have to make decisions. They are not held liable. 
they will not lose election if they make a wrong decision. But politicians actually have to make a decision that satisfies many constituencies, still make some progress or solve some problem or resolve some problem and so on. Plus, climate shift may have benefits. For example, if you look at the uh, risk or the predicted impact of global warming, you're going to have positive benefits in some regions like Canada and Siberia and up here in the north and down here. Because if Siberia gets warm and the snow disappears, they can grow a lot of wheat and become the breadbasket of the world. So if there is a politician there that's trying to solve climate problem and reduce global warming, he may actually have negative impact on the uh, outcome or Siberia, right? So <laughs> how do you decide uh, whether 100 years later or 20 years later, you will lose the positive benefits of climate change in order to play with the world, or it will actually improve your own situation as well. This is not a very easy problem to solve. This is again the risk. Uh, this is the inverse of the uh, adaptation index. There is very low risk for the rich countries, whereas the poor countries are going to have high climate risk, so they have to decide how they're going to deal with it. So this then comes to the other difficult, wicked problem of how to convince people of the risks of climate change and potential dangers and the uncertainty associated with all those things. There is a construct called the rider and the elephant, which comes out of uh, books by people like Jonathan Haidt, who is an evolutionary biologist, psychologist, who says that the human brain is made up of uh, emotional part, which is like the amygdala, which we don't know, don't worry about and the neocortex, which is the rational part. When a big decision has to be made and some behavioral change has to be brought about, both the neocortex and the emotional elephant have to agree with each other. And elephant and the rider concept is that the rider is very small. Rational part is not the one that ultimately determines it. It's the emotional elephant, which is hard to steer. But once it gets going, it will keep going. That's what determines, but two have to be together. So it always comes about messaging the elephant. So I'll just make a joke here with some photos I found on the internet. Here's an elephant that is peacefully walking. The cars behind are waiting patiently, whereas one driver will come from this side and will try to pass the elephant instead of waiting and see that the elephant gets angry, which means if your message is not correct and you emotionally upset people, you'll actually end up having not solving the problem, but just creating a bigger problem. So here is a car that is trying to pass the elephant, doesn't mind so far, then he gets angry, so he pushes him into the bushes, okay? So when we communicate climate change or any wicked problem, we have to be careful about how we do it. Plus, how people try to cheat, for example, a politician may say, I understand your pain, I know I've been a poor man, I've been selling this or that when I was young and so on. So this is just a joke of a man who's created an elephant out of a buffalo by tying this uh, trunk to it. So human mind in general is intuitive, especially when we are born, but the rational ignorance or the rationalizing of the problems can make us selfish and ignore problems just because uh, we think it's not going to affect us. Plus, we are, it's all about uh, uh, adaptation, but adaptation is very empirical. Oh, this. Uh, I will play this uh, video here. So climate change adaptation may happen when you actually face a problem. So here are some elephants trying to cross this little ditch. And you can see that the big elephant is able to get down peacefully. The elephant behind doesn't know what to do. So he's going to empirically evolve a solution just by looking at the problem. So he's going to just lie down and roll over. So. You cannot prepare for all eventualities of climate change. Sometimes, like farmers do every year, rainfall rates change, rainfall amounts change, they try to deal with it. So adaptation is part of human life, so we have to be prepared for these kind of painful things. If I have a couple of minutes, uh, I would like to play a video. Do I have a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure, Professor Raku, yes. Okay. So the philosophical question I would like to raise here, especially there are some physicists in the audience, I think. Uh, every life in uh, the universe or most of the processes in the universe are basically dissipating energy. All life forms use energy and pollute. What if uh, we evolved basically to accelerate this pollution, the pollution and 
dissipation process. We have become so good at polluting now. So where will the solutions come from then? Okay, it's a wicked problem. Uh, yet we need to deal with it, maybe resolve it rather than solve it. So this is just one uh, video that I like to show, which is kind of over the top, but gives you a sense of uh, what is possible and what young children should be thinking about. Solutions for food, water, energy, and health. Especially if you are growing up in India and you are wondering what to do with your life. Climate change is a problem, but it is pretty clear now that we need to just find solutions. It's like buying an uh, iPhone. Everybody wants an iPhone. They don't care whether it's good or bad for the environment. So we need to have solutions that people will just use because they are good and they are fun. Okay. So this is one kind of a video that uh, shows it. So just see if uh, uh, you can hear it. I have set the uh, audio steering as well. Solar freaking roadways. Can you hear it? What are they? They're solar yes. freaking roadways. What do they want from me? Well, they're solar freaking. Roadway. Okay, so actually this time, what is it? It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels. Smart, microprocessing, interlocking, hexagonal solar units. No more useless asphalt and concrete just sitting there baking in the sun, needing to be repaved, and filling with potholes that ruin your axle alignment on your sweet ride, bro. These are intelligent solar panels. Replace the panel at a time if damaged or malfunctioning. They're covered with a new tempered glass material that has been designed and tested to meet all impact, load, and traction requirements. Oh, and did I mention that they're also solar panels? They generate electricity. They generate capital. They pay for themselves, and they keep paying more because we're not going to run out of sun for like 15 billion years. That lowers the cost of energy, unlike those bills in the mail that keep going up. And it's clean energy. Everyone can theoretically drive an electric car with no pollution and a minimal carbon footprint. Can you imagine how good our cities would smell? How much healthier we'd all be? Excuse me, young man. Am I being led to believe that this thing is some sort of thing? Yes, it's a thing, a real thing. And clean energy is only its primary function. Grab a notepad, because this is where it gets interesting. For those in the north, the panels use energy they collect to power elements to keep the surface temperature a few degrees above freezing. They're heated. No more ice and snow on roads causing traffic delays, accidents, and injuries. No more shoveling your driveway and sidewalk. No salt corroding your car or wasting tax money on snow removal. And you can ride your bike or drive your motorcycle all year round. Whoa! Every panel has a series of LED lights on the circuit board that can be programmed to make landscape designs, warning signs, parking lot configurations, whatever. These roads never have to have lanes repainted, just reprogrammed to whatever we choose or whatever works best. Imagine a highway road lighting up ahead of you. How much safer it would be to drive at night. There'd be improved visibility for pilots landing on solar landing strips. Imagine walking onto a solar recreation court and choosing a sports configuration. Wanna play basketball? Cool. Kids wanna play hopscotch in Foursquare? Awesome. Ball hockey? Done. And with LED lights under your feet it's gonna look like i think i'll stop it there but you get the idea so i think exciting solutions have to uh, emerge and hopefully young people are uh, going to worry about solutions rather than have climate anxiety and be scared that the world is coming to an end so i'll stop with that okay thank you thank you professor Raghu, for the very interesting uh, talk we have collected a few questions already. Uh, so a note to the attendees, if you have still not uh, posted your question, you are free to post the questions. And I'll now ask questions one by one to the speaker. Yeah, just give me a moment. So uh, Professor Raghu, uh, first question is from Gurkirat Singh uh, from YouTube and he's asking, don't you think all of this money that is being spent on space programs should instead be spent on things that affect Earth? <laughs> That's always a difficult problem. You have to think about it more philosophically. Uh, people say, should people have dogs and feed the dogs while there are people starving? Dogs have benefits for individuals and for communities and so on. And uh, where each generation is known for its exploration. If uh, Galileo sat there and didn't invent the various things and uh, Kepler and Copernicus and others, uh, what would we have now? So it's not exactly either or zero sum game that we either go to Mars or we solve climate change. We have to find a way to explore the universe, understand the fundamentals of our universe, origin of life, origin of the universe, and so on, while also uh, solving uh, climate change problems. So I think. Uh, the two are uh, not really uh, one or the other solution. That's my opinion. But 
it always seems like we are spending a lot of money there but you know you have to somehow uh, uh, find a way to keep humanity focused on some exciting exploration for which uh, posterity will thank us uh, and solve climate change so that posterity doesn't blame us for leaving them a mess in terms of climate change that's my opinion but that's doesn't that's a wicked problem as well you don't have a real solution you can only think at a given time do you need to reduce spending on space and spend it somewhere else okay thank you thank you uh, he goes on to ask uh, uh, another question uh, are all important decisions about global warming only taken by political leaders if so then how can a layman contribute in reducing co2 emissions this is a very general question yeah yeah no i mean uh, the big so uh, you can split that into kind of global governance questions so co2 for example is a global problem so global community under the united nations framework convention on climate change and the intergovernmental panel on climate change have to deal with the international agreements then you have national level decisions on how you participate in the global action plus solve your own energy food water health problems like renewables reduced emissions from agriculture sustainable agriculture etc and then individuals uh, have a contribution to make because as i said if you drive less if you uh, eat less meat uh, consuming meat is by the way a huge contributor but maybe you enjoy your uh, chicken and your uh, fish and so on so there is a compromise to be made so it's the scale issue uh, eventually as i said if huge solutions come by let's say hydroponics uh, let's just use the yeah, uh, ocean uh, for agriculture and we can grow everything we want or, uh, aquaculture will solve all the fish problem and so on so it's up to you it comes down to an individual choice uh, where you can travel less drive less fly less eat less meat and uh, drive more bicycle or walk and then uh, reduce your own carbon footprint there are many apps which allow you to, tra to track your carbon footprint you can do that as well so politicians are required for the big decisions to you know, implement solutions but scientists have to come up with solutions provide proper guidance and uh, so it's at all levels thank you uh, professor agu so i'll uh, continue on the same theme manila Bopai is asking, how does consumption of meat adds to global warming? So, if you think about uh, chicken or uh, beef, beef is the most expensive one. For each kilogram of meat you produce, thousands of calories are, are consumed by the animal, and lots of land is used for grazing them and growing them, and then a lot of its parts are wasted. So, for a per calorie the amount of environmental footprint uh, meat has uh, versus vegetarian food is uh, really incomparable so production of calories from meat even chicken which is much cheaper than beef uh, is much more expensive it's, i think uh, seven times as expensive as a vegetarian food to eat uh, chicken and then several hundred times to eat beef so it's the environmental footprint per calorie of uh, food that is generated out of animals versus uh, vegetables and plant-based uh, products. So there are ideas now, there are actually products called plant-based meat, which make products in the lab that taste like meat. And I have tasted some of them. They are just fine, like the veggie burger and so on. So we don't know how, how solutions will emerge, but that's where the footprint of meat comes in. Thank you. Uh, Ashutosh Kumar is asking, uh, what's holding up the government, civil servants, scientists, and people to come to a common ground and work uh, tirelessly to stop the catastrophic disaster due to climate? Yeah, so that was the main point I was trying to make, that it's a wicked problem in the sense, it's not like you can do one thing and solve it. It has so many aspects to it. If you just boil it down to the main things, it's about food, which means how you produce the food, uh, how much irrigation, how much fertilizers, uh, and so on, plus how much of vegetarian part, meat part, and then uh, water, energy, health. So it's a wicked problem, essentially, because it's not so easy to agree. For example, uh, we all agree now that solar and wind is good, but uh, can you supply everybody with solar and wind? Of course not. We still have a long way to go. 
hydroelectric nuclear is needed, but nuclear raises a lot of concerns of safety. Coal should be stopped, but we are not in a position to stop coal yet. At some point, uh, I think one of the Saudi Arabian energy ministers is supposed to have said that the Stone Age didn't come to an end because they ran out of stones. Uh, it's because they developed other tools. So fossil fuels and coal will go away when we have other solutions. Uh, we cannot just leave them in the ground till we have actual solutions. So everybody is working and not everybody agrees that climate change is the most dire situation we are facing. Uh, for a country like India, it may look like something else. COVID comes, then you uh, stop worrying about climate change and plastic use. Plastic use has jumped because of COVID by a lot. So there is always something that's battling climate change as one of the big problems. So that's the main issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So uh, I'll move on to the next question by Devesh Jain. He's asking, what is the prospects of gene modifications in plants to help efficient CO2 capture? Yeah, there is. there are efforts going on, uh, but that is not a, a deep pocket in the sense that a tree grows, captures a certain amount of carbon, and then it gets mature. Uh, it may stop its efficiency to take up carbon goes down. Plus, if there is a fire, then all that carbon will get released. So as it is, the plants are taking up more carbon because of what's called carbon fertilization effect. So if the leaves are opening the stomata and taking up CO2 to photosynthesize, they open long enough to uh, prevent too much loss of water, which they have moved laboriously from the roots. So if CO2 increases, then they can open for a shorter time and so on. So their efficiency in some sense has gone up and there are efforts to do uh, artificial plants, artificial leaves and so on to produce uh, carbohydrates and capture carbon, but not necessarily modifying the plants themselves, but create artificial plants. For example, if you want to take out CO2 from the air, you have what is called an artificial plant designed by uh, Gary Lackner, which where the air that's flowing through is uh, catalyzed and uh, scrubbed from the air with some chemicals precipitated out and so on. So you are on the right track, but it's not necessarily gene modification, but it's artificial plants, artificial plants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Roshni. Uh, she's asking, is there a correlation between the industrial revolution and the spike that was in the average global temperature graph? Is that Roshni, Joseph's daughter? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> understood. Uh, yes, actually, if you remember the temperature change I showed, there was a little ice age that followed the uh, uh, medieval warming uh, that started because of volcanic eruptions and then minima and solar radiation because of the minima and sunspots and so on. And we don't know exactly why that little ice age ended, but one of the solutions seemed to be that the industrial revolution and the increased coal burning uh, started to put a lot of uh, carbon on this uh, ice, which reduces its effectivity and it melts. But yes. The emissions since the industrial revolution is uh, exactly what is responsible for the warming uh, in the last couple of centuries. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Shikhar. Uh, Shikhar is asking, uh, how will Paris Agreement help developing countries like India? Um, a Paris Agreement tries to protect certain interests of the poor countries. For example, the refrigerant HFC, which is very damaging, has to be replaced soon. Uh, the rich countries are supposed to replace it by 2025, whereas the poor countries are given till 2035 or so. And uh, there are supposed to be some funds which help adapt better and so on. Uh, the, the change from Kyoto Protocol to Paris was that in Paris Agreement, every country voluntarily submits a so-called nationally determined contribution where they will say how they will reduce their carbon footprint, how much, and there are there is room to arrange your own ways of reducing. That's the way to help because now the process is more democratic. In Kyoto Protocol, there were just rules. Everybody had rules, top-down rules, which didn't work at all. Kyoto Protocol was basically a complete failure. Uh, but as you can see, India is investing in uh, solar and uh, wind to uh, reduce their carbon footprint. 
Uh, they are doing afforestation or planting trees to create new carbon sinks and so on. So it's not a direct help, but there are many mechanisms where developing countries are given assistance to uh, work with the global community to reduce overall emissions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Raghu. So I'll move on to the next question. Next question is by Kavin P. Uh, sir, what is temperature anomaly? Ah, yes. Um, anomaly is anything, it's the English word, as you would think, anomaly is a deviation from the normal. So if uh, today is uh, February 21st, uh, in India, if you are sitting in Bangalore, you expect a certain temperature. Uh, that's called a climatology. So long-term average, uh, you may be a young person, but if you ask your grandfather uh, or grandmother, they will have a sense of what is the normal temperature for 21st. But if it's very warm or very cold, unusually warm or unusually cold compared to what we expect, that's what we call anomaly. So it's anomalously warm or anomalously cold. So when we say global warming, the temperatures are increasing, which means they are uh, anomalously warmer than what they should be. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Divesh has another question. He says, uh, Shanghai was regarded as one of the most polluted cities in the world back in 2006-07. What measures have they adopted to turn it around? Um, it was Beijing. Beijing uh, actually uh, was, it was funny because in the beginning they were behaving somewhat like what India was doing, saying, oh, no, there is no pollution problem, it's just a seasonal problem and so on. But many of the international companies began to leave, so they decided that this is a problem. Plus, they had the Olympics in 2008, I think. Um, so they have basically uh, dealt heavily with the manufacturing industries in the area. They have created these alternate driving days. They have reduced uh, the, uh, in the winter, Beijing gets very harsh winters and people used to burn wood and so on. They have to, uh, banned these kind of fires. Uh, so there are many measures they have taken, uh, including some chemical ways of reducing pollution and so on. It is still pretty bad, by the way. It is better, but it is still pretty bad. It is like comparing Delhi and Mumbai. Mumbai is pretty bad, it's unhealthy. But people think it's okay. But uh, if you compare to Delhi, it's obviously much better. So Beijing has gotten better, but it's still pretty bad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is by Ajit Ekpote. He is asking, what is the possibility of a runaway greenhouse effect on the on the Earth in future, say 100 to 200 years uh, hence? Yeah as is supposed to have happened on Venus millions of years ago. Uh, yeah, so that's why we look, I showed one temperature record that went back to the dinosaurs. We always look at what is called climate sensitivity. Uh, essentially, it's when you double CO2 and keep it at that level, what will happen to the temperature. The past climates give us a sense of what is possible on Earth. In our history, we have had global uh, glaciations, what are called snowball earth episodes, but the warmest temperatures we have had are basically uh, what we had uh, during the dinosaur times uh, 65 million years ago to some 200 million years ago where there was no uh, ice in Arctic, uh, Greenland, uh, Antarctica, Himalaya, and so on, uh, which was about 15 to 20 degrees warmer than uh, present. Uh, the runaway warming on uh, Venus and uh, is related to how much closer it is to the sun. So there is more energy coming in. Uh, the runaway cooling on Mars is more related to the uh, greenhouse effect and the uh, various processes needed. If you form too much methane, for example, you will block off the sunlight and so on. So there is no real evidence that uh, Earth will get uh, beyond, uh, let's say, 10 degrees, 15 degrees warmer than uh, at present. All the ice could melt on Greenland and Antarctica and so on. So Sea level rise of 100 meters, more than 100 meters can happen. That's what is more worrisome than a runaway global warming. It will be runaway when all the glaciers melt. But it will not reach the 460 degrees uh, centigrade of the Venus. Uh, we don't have that much uh, potential for global warming. Uh, thank you. Um, 
unless you release everything that's in the solid uh, earth, which is very unlikely. Thank you, uh, Professor Raghu. So, uh, Deepak Ipachin says, uh, thanks for the nice talk, Professor Raghu. Do you think carbon capture technology or lab meat would be a key player in reducing our carbon footprint? Carbon capture and sequestration uh, will have to be pretty much uh, the way we are going even today. Uh, we are not going to reduce our emissions anytime soon. Uh, so carbon capture sequestration is being tried at various scales. Uh, as you probably know that the concentration is so small in the air that it's hard to take out. So it's the cost effectiveness and the efficiency and so on. Plus we have to keep it, but uh, game changer will probably come from that in, uh, in addition to reducing emission itself. So I expect carbon capture and sequestration to be large. As for lab produced food, I think Craig Bentner and others are trying it. There is plant-based meat being produced in the lab, uh, veggie burgers, many things are produced in the lab, including uh, the junk food we eat like chips and so on, which are based on a natural uh, food material, but they are uh, made into something else in the lab. So uh, lab-based food uh, is already playing a lot of role uh, as junk food, but as healthy food, I think it will uh, play uh, a bigger role, but I don't know how much bigger. Uh, yeah, that's what we see. Uh, thank you, Professor Raghu. So I will club a few questions together. Uh, they tend to point to uh, one thing. So for example, the uh, disaster that India witnessed in uh, recently, mm. this, uh, so the audience, I think, would like to know your thoughts about it. Are we going to see more such events uh, in future, or uh, is it natural, or is it a consequence of the global warming? I mean, what are your thoughts on this? If they are talking about the Chamoli Glacier first. Uh, exactly, yes, yes, yes. 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 Um, the Himalayas, uh, some part of Himalayas are amplifying global warming. Uh, which means the warming there is faster than the global warming rate by 10, 20, 30%. So there are processes in the Himalayas that are accelerating the warming, which does create uh, these kind of situations. Uh, Himalayan glaciers are uh, debris covered. They are very dirty. So that means their reflectivity is low, so they absorb more radiation. So it is a concern. and. Uh, we are uh, losing glacier mass in some regions, but you have to be careful because as you warm the air, the air can hold more water vapor because of this thermodynamic forces, Clapeyron motion, and so on, which means the, 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 the potential for snow also goes up. So Karakoram, for example, is getting more snow and it's actually glacier mass is growing, but there are other regions where glacier mass is being lost. So. The uh, way to think about it is such bursts can be natural, but what global warming and climate change does is it loads the dice. So the probability of it happening is increased. If you throw a dice many times, if it is not loaded, you should get random probability of all numbers being almost equal. But when you load it, you can get one number to come up more often. So if a glacier burst were to happen every 200 years, global warming can make it happen every 20 years or so. So we will have uh, more of these for sure if the warming continues this way. Thank you, Professor Raghu. So I've been continuously asking questions. I guess we have five more minutes. So uh, Supurna Sinha is asking, uh, from our experience during lockdown in 2020, we have noticed that carbon emissions related um, climate change issues have been more under control. Could a similar lifestyle change be used in the long run to help climate change problem? Uh, yeah, so that was a good prototype example of reducing emissions and see what happens. But as I showed the 2020 temperatures, there is this committed warming. In other words, because CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for so long, it accumulates, uh, which means even though we reduced it for one year, the warming, 2020 was the uh, warmest year uh, tied to 2016. So you have to reduce it and keep it reduced and keep reducing for a long time uh, to see the impact. So the 2020 example is good in terms of uh, how much can be reduced by various activities. So that did show us that industrial activity reduced by and et cetera, reduces emissions. Uh, of course, we are already back, as I said, to normal levels. So 
uh, the solutions have to be about reducing pollution and emission that has to be sustained. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few more questions. I think these are the last few questions. Uh, so Vignesh wants to know, could you tell us something about climate change tipping points and how potent is its danger? Yeah, basically those are kind of a, a point of no return. One of the ones we have to watch very closely is the Greenland glacier, which is melting and it's accelerating, which is actually the same process that happened behind the Chamoli glacier. What happens is the, the uh, sun on top of the glacier begins to melt the glacier, create a pond, and that water has much lower reflectivity than the glacier around, so it absorbs more heat and keeps on uh, melting more, and it begins to burrow into the glacier and creates what are called moulons, which are, are going to drill into the glacier and go all the way to the bottom. So if you Google M-O-U-L-I-N moulin, which is a French word, Mula, uh, you will see what it is. That can go all the way to the bottom and lubricate the bottom and make the glacier slide more easily towards the ocean and melt off. So that is one of the tipping points we have to watch for. And Arctic ice melt, which is the same process. It's sea ice, so it doesn't get as thick as the glacier. But uh, once it starts melting, the humidity change and the ocean heat uptake reduce reflection it's going to accelerate and there is some evidence that we have been melting, uh, reducing the ice extent over the Arctic for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, now the question is, will it completely disappear in the next uh, few decades? So that's another tipping point. Glacier is a tipping point in the sense to build it takes a long time. It takes about 100,000 years to build a glacier. If you melt it, you're not going to recover it in uh, a few human generations. So that's a tipping point. There are other tipping points, like maybe Amazon forest will collapse and so on, but they are they are more speculative than the, uh, the Arctic ice and the Greenland glacier. Thing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. So uh, we have a request from Rishabh. Uh, I think I clubbed his question with uh, a few other questions, but uh, he says that uh, I'll read his full question actually. So with the augmentation of Rishabh is asking with the augmentation of global warming, the ice in the Antarctic area can crack and that huge mass of ice falling in water can cause tsunami too. Yes. So what are your thoughts on this? Um, his specific question, he's very specific about Antarctica and the tsunami in the ocean. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah, there is examples in the William Sound of the Gulf of Alaska of such landslides where a glacier collapse I think created a tsunami that uh, went far far. Uh, as far as I know, there is not any uh, glacier that's large enough to cause a tsunami that is uh, going to go, let's say, all the way to India, uh, somewhere else. So I wouldn't worry about glacier caused uh, tsunamis right now. As I said, Greenland is an unknown. If there is any chance of a massive Greenland glacier chopping off, then uh, it is being monitored very well. So I'm not aware of any glacier caused tsunami danger melting right now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Raghu. So uh, I think this is uh, would be the last question from the attendees. Uh, so Prajwal Padmanabh is asking how much of the dialogue around climate change solutions is centered around population problems, like the old Malthusian ideas of population growth that led to harsh laws for poor people. What are the ethics of dialogues such as this? Uh, yeah, so the United Nations framework hesitated to deal with climate for a long time or even mention it because it has all sorts of religious uh, issues associated with it. But the newer assessment reports that came out in 2014 and now will come out in 2021, which delayed a little bit because of COVID. They do mention uh, population. Uh, as I said, uh, I have an article in uh, Newsweek maybe last year or year before on uh, the various population issues. And as I alluded to briefly here, population increase by itself is not necessarily responsible for the uh, global warming because 
the consumption of the richer families with fewer kids is much higher. That's one thing. The other is uh, the Malthusian uh, explosion, that's a disaster, whatever, it didn't happen. Even Paul Ulrich in the 1960s talked about population bond and so on, which was solved by the Green uh, Revolution, etc. Uh, but the main thing I, I would worry about is educating girls in poor countries because there is plenty of evidence that uh, every year of education after grade seven can reduce one child in many cases. So educate women, that's the best contraceptive. They are going to reduce the population which is already happening. And there are even some scenarios like empty planet, which argue that uh, we will go below replacement level, which means well, we will have so few people reproducing that the population will begin to drop. And by 2100, we could be down to just 1 billion and so on. So population projections are a bit uncertain. Uh, but what is certain is that fertility rates have dropped almost everywhere other than uh, idiosyncratic countries like the Gulf countries where they uh, pay people to have kids or uh, Niger or Nigeria and so on. But uh, Malthusian problem may or may not happen. Uh, population is being discussed as part of the climate problem, but there are no rules uh, being imposed on anybody. Awareness is the way to go. But it's a complicated problem, but we can solve it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raghu. So those were the questions from our uh, live uh, viewers, uh, live stream viewers. Uh, if there are any questions by our co-host, uh, Professor Sam, Professor Kopakumar, uh, then uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or if you have any comment. I just wanted to thank Raghu for his talk, but uh, no question for me. Professor Gopakumar. Uh, yeah, no, it was a very nice talk. Uh, uh, I really uh, like the way you framed the whole uh, question. Yeah, thank you. So uh, before uh, we end today's session, I also have one question, uh, Professor Raghu, for, for you. So, uh, I, I mean, there are several news that many um, automakers have promised that they will go electric uh, in years to come. I mean, how big would that impact be uh, given uh, a large uh, automakers go completely electric? Um, if that succeeds, obviously that will reduce emission by a lot, but the end-to-end -end problem I would worry about is the uh, infrastructure to uh, supply electricity, uh, charging stations, uh, the mileage you would get per charge and so on and so forth. But uh, it's an irreversible track we are on. Everybody will go electric. Uh, the big problem will be about trucks and so on, the large vehicles. Uh, cars and scooters and motorbikes should happen and it will have a very good impact on pollution. For example, uh, Beijing actually, I forgot to mention, Beijing has an uh, infinite number of uh, electric scooters and little vehicles which also contributed to reducing emission. Delhi has given away lots of battery operated uh, speed, uh, rickshaws, which help reduce emission a lot. Uh, there are electric cars, BMW, all the luxury car makers are also coming with uh, electric cars. So, uh, I think GM uh, in US and uh, many Indian companies will also go electric. Uh, there are electric scooters already. So it is a good uh, direction, but that also means uh, electricity availability of uh, recharge stations, uh, batteries, disposal of batteries, and so on will also have to be there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Raghu, for the fantastic talk and uh, very interesting answers to the questions. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Professor Raghu. Thank you, everyone.